Looking back, it's hard to believe Americans had to start an entire campaign to get Xenoblade Chronicles released in the States. It's almost harder to believe that the campaign actually worked, and RPG fans were blessed with a game both epic in scale and intimate in story. And that success led to a sequel that expanded and recontextualized the events of the first game while telling its own tale. And now, those stories are intertwining with the announcement of Xenoblade Chronicles 3, bringing together worlds and characters of those first two games. There have been crossovers before, but something like this feels wholly different. It's the culmination of a shared universe that's been the hallmark of Monolith Soft. Naturally, the announcement trailer is also ripe for analysis. But this is the combination of two worlds, right? So it's only appropriate that I bring in the one and only Chugga Conroy to help with a deep dive of this size. Keep in mind that we'll be trying to make this analysis as spoiler-free as possible, but spoilers for the first two games are inevitable when talking about certain aspects. That said, every spoiler will be placed at the end of the analysis and we'll be sure to provide a proper warning. The executive director, Tetsuya Takahashi, claims that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 will still be enjoyable to newcomers, but we'd still recommend playing the previous games anyway. They're great and well worth the time and build up to this new entry. But it's time to put our heads together and see what awaits in this new world of Ionios. And that is a perfect place to begin. The name Ionius is somewhat similar to Bionis and Mechonis of the original game. Both indicated what kind of people lived on these massive beings, with Bionis home to organic life, and Mechonis as the origin of machines. It's possible that Ionios offers a clue to the nature of this world. Now, Ion was an important name in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, though I'm unsure whether it has any real connection here. Instead, the trailer indicates several times through dialogue that the name might tie in more with the Greek god of the same name. Ion was a god of time, specifically the idea of cyclical ages, such as a year rotating between seasons, or the zodiac. And Ionios itself can be translated as without beginning or end. This could imply that this new world is trapped in a cycle of time, unable to escape the loop, and the dialogue is dripping with clues to this same idea. Keep in mind that almost nothing spoken in the trailer matches what's happening on the screen. It's being pulled from other moments in order to presumably keep a sense of mystery while providing clues and increasing intrigue. It's sort of what trailers do. And many of the lines have something to do with the idea of time and cyclic ages. But before we can look into that, it's necessary to know more of the world itself. Thankfully, the Nintendo UK website has provided new details, so we have some names to go with faces and a better idea of what's happening in Ionios itself. There are two nations that make up the world, Kevis and Agnes, who seem to be at constant war with one another. And naturally, their names might provide a clue to something more. For instance, Agnes is the Greek word for pure or holy, while the phrase Agnes Dei translates from Latin to Lamb of God. Kevis is a bit harder to place. The only translation that a search reveals is that it's Hungarian for few or little. It's difficult to say whether this is intentional or not, but it doesn't feel like it ties into the same idea as Agnes. Speaking of Agnes, the term lamb was an important one to Xenogears, but the context in Xenoblade Chronicles 3 seems pointedly different. As for their actual descriptions, Keves is a nation where mechanical technology was developed and their armies, who wear black, are mainly composed of combat vehicles and units of small mobile weapons operated by soldiers riding them. I think I need to have a chat with Nintendo about their concept of small. During the battle scene, Kevis soldiers are shown wielding both rifles and swords as they rush forward, their helmets resembling the ones worn by the Colony 9 Defense Force in Xenoblade 1. But alongside them are machines lit with blue lights tearing through the battlefield almost as if they were motorcycles. But their designs are distinctly similar to the Mechon, and this point is driven home by the absolutely immense machine on their side that even has a face like the infamous Metal Face. However, it doesn't seem to be autonomous. Instead, it looks as if Kevis used the scrap of the Mechon to craft military vehicles for themselves. Agnes is described as a nation strong in ether, a magical technology. Their forces are built around units that specialize in ether combat, and they fight with small, mobile, autonomous weapons that use that technology. While their army is never shown in the trailer, screenshots do provide a look at the design of Agnes soldiers. They are dressed all in white with green highlights and wield laser rifles, swords, and spears. 
Their machines are also sleeker in design while remaining somewhat bulky. It could be based off late game enemies from Xenoblade 2, but more like an evolved version if not redesigned completely. Considering how an image shows Kevis soldiers running away, Agnes might be winning this war. If I had to hazard a guess, no side is truly right in this fight, as evidenced by the six core party members, three from each side. First up is Noah, who is being positioned as the main male protagonist and is a Kevis soldier. The website also claims he's something called an offseer, though there's no indication of what that exactly is. We have a few guesses, but we'll save those for later. The only other thing of note is that he mourns for soldiers who have lost their lives on the battlefield, likely a pretty common sentiment. Next up is Lance, who isn't given much focus. All that's said is he wields a greatsword that doubles as a shield, something demonstrated in the trailer. The most interesting bit about him concerns his race, but that's something that will have to be saved for spoilers. The final Kevis party member is Yuni, who might be the most intriguing of the cast so far. She's described as a childhood friend of Noah and Lan's, though how is that possible when she's a high Entia? Generally, they have a much longer lifespan, so does she actually look her age? Or did she somehow become friends with Noah when he was still a child? She's also proof of how High Entian blood has become further diluted over the years, as she's the first High Entia we've seen without silver or white hair, and her wings are even smaller than Melia's. This is a cool bit of world building, but what has us truly intrigued are the color of her wings. In certain scenes, generally at night, her wings are completely black. Yet other scenes throughout the trailer, and even in her official artwork, depict her with white wings. What's going on? Why do they change? It can't be a trick of the lighting as they are distinctly black rather than a shaded white. We just don't know anything except that Chugga definitely likes the black wing look. Shifting over to the Agnes side of the cast, Mio is the other main protagonist, but all that is said about her is how she's an offseer like Noah. With her are Tyon, who's a tactician, and Senna, who possesses great strength despite her small size. There are reasons for that, but again, it should be saved for the spoiler section. The last takeaway from this bit of UK info is that the theme of the game will be life. And that's emphasized by the first words from Noah. Fighting in order to live, and living to fight. It's both a cycle without end and the dichotomy of a soldier, which the entire cast is. It also ties into the concept that Ionios is trapped in a cycle of time that I mentioned before. So now that we know the characters, it's time to take a look at the dialogue that fuels our theory even more. Speaking of fuel, Tyon says, They're not your friends anymore. They're his fuel. This makes it sound like he's trying to calm an ally who lost allies and maybe had those old friends turned against them. It sounds similar to how the Mechon ate humans in order to fuel themselves. Or maybe this fuel is something they all need, or at least Kevis soldiers do. As Uni says, What good filling up these flickering clocks in our eyes? It'll never replace the friends we've lost. What in the world does she mean by clocks in their eyes? With life being a major theme, could the soldiers have the ability to see others' lifespans? Could that be what an offseer is capable of? Alternatively, what if they can see the past lives of people? That would certainly justify the frustration of not being able to replace friends. And then there's the idea of filling them up. Are the ones being fueled actually the soldiers themselves? How dark could this possibly go? Now, this next line of dialogue has caused a bit of a debate between the two of us. I believe Mio says, the flame clock has to go, while Chugga thinks she says, the blade clock has to go. The flame clock, it has to go! Either way, what is she referring to? Is this the object that fuels the soldier's power? If it's a flame clock, could it actually be fueled by Pyra? And if it's a blade clock, could it be fueled by the blades themselves? I can't help but imagine a furnace where core crystals are shoved inside, and it makes me shudder. The final piece of dialogue that ties into the theme of life and cyclic natures is spoken by the High Entia in the mask. And don't worry, we'll get to her identity later. Ouroboros abhor this world. Ouroboros, for those who don't know, is a famous depiction of a snake eating its own tail and meant to convey the cyclical nature of life, death, and rebirth. But who is Ouroboros in this context? It comes across as a faction and perhaps even the true enemy that these two should be fighting. But could it be something else? 
It would make sense if their goal is to keep Ionios in an endless cycle of violence, fighting, and death. How would one escape something of that nature, especially when they're a soldier forced to fight for that nature in order to preserve their side? Even this mysterious fueling process seems to tie into it, making everything feel futile, yet inevitable. A tale of breaking this cycle to preserve life could make for a wonderful story that fits in perfectly with what came before in Xenoblade. But that's all the story conjecture based on names, descriptions, and real-world lore. It could be true or not. But let's switch focus to what the trailer actually shows us. And it all begins with Noah playing a flute while yellow cube-shaped particles drift around him in a canyon. Presumably, this is a song for the fallen soldiers of Kves, or perhaps even all life lost in a battle. Maybe it picks up after the huge fight depicted in the transition right after, or maybe this is another possibility for what an offseer is, someone who lays the dead to rest and sends their spirit into the ether. Either way, his flute is a major aspect of his character and a major element to the music of Xenoblade 3 as explained by Takahashi. It comes back several more times in the trailer as well. The next is what appears to be some kind of ceremony or concert, or perhaps it's more akin to the sending of Aether of Fallen Kevis allies back to the planet. The woman the scene focuses on isn't the only one playing the flute. There's a whole group as the cube-shaped particles rise into the sky. And this is important. It has to be. These particles are a part of the new logo. And the logos of Xenoblade always represent something from the story. One had the cleaved look to represent the Monado. Two had the flames to represent Pyrus flames. So these particles of what we believe to be Aether has to be important to three in some way. But this isn't the only importance of the logo. The blonde woman has some kind of symbol on her hand. It's hard to see what it depicts here, but Yuni actually has one as well, though it's instead on her chest. The symbol appears to be brand new, almost an H in shape, though the center line is made of a series of diamonds. But the whole thing is likely diamonds, as Lance has the symbol as well, with his on his chin. Could this mark indicate that someone is a special soldier in Kevis? Is this what grants the flickering clocks that Yuni mentioned earlier? It's undoubtedly important, whatever it is, because this symbol seems to be the same as the diamond pattern on the Logos 3. So is this symbol exclusive to Kevis soldiers? We don't see any on the Agnes trio, but the two sides could share tech if both have soldiers known as Offseers. That seems unlikely though based on the next scene featuring the flute. Noah and Mio are playing them together, the first bit of peace we've seen between the two sides the entire trailer. But is the flute something common between the two sides, or is Noah teaching Mio about the flute and what it's used for? Obviously, we can't know for sure, but there are clues to what might get the pair to stop attacking one another. It should be noted that neither of them are in their soldier outfits anymore. Outside the duty to kill one another, they don't have a reason to. But there's more to it than this. The final use of the flute comes at the very end as the two play their flutes in front of a snow-covered mountain which is actually the body of the Orion Titan. Somehow, it's split in two in the passing years. But that's not the part that draws the eyes. No, it's the sword of the Makanis just next to it. An absolute confirmation that the worlds of one and two have merged. And the crazy thing is, this has been the plan for a very long time. As written by Takahashi, this visual was conceived sometime between the end of Xenoblade Chronicles development and the beginning of Xenoblade Chronicles 2's. This has been the plan all along, and it's incredible for it. Returning to the trailer, it shows a fight between the two trios, though we don't know how this came to be. Was it happenstance? Was one side assigned to attack the other? Or is something else going on? Noah's weapon is a sword that's very similar to the Monado, but we'll talk more about that in the spoiler section. Mio wields twin rings, and she seems to be the better fighter of the two, at least in this example. She manages to strike Noah, though this isn't a blood splatter in the cutscene. It's a piece of his collar. He barely dodged it and only lost a chunk of his clothes with the damage still visible, despite it being such a quick moment. Eventually, Lance appears during the fight and demonstrates exactly how his greatsword can also work as a shield. And while it does deflect Senna's giant hammer, the shield also shatters from it, indicating that they may be evenly matched. The fight continues later in the trailer with Yuni dodging behind a rock while wielding what at first appears to be a staff or spear, despite the fact that she's described as a healer. However, a quick shot reveals that her weapon is actually an ether rifle, just like Charlie used to heal in Xenoblade 1. 
It's not that simple though, as later on she's with Tyon facing off against an unknown enemy while in the desert. There she's holding the weapon like a staff. Is it possible that she'll be a combination of Sharla and Melia gameplay-wise? In fact, extrapolating from this could clue us into each character's role in battle. Oftentimes in RPGs, roles are broken down to attackers, defenders, and healers, though of course there's room to mix and match. The three characters on each side seem to follow this dichotomy. Yuni's the healer, with his shield lands as the defender, and Noah naturally falls into the attacker role. As for the Agnes trio, we have to do a bit more supposition. Mio uses twin rings, the same weapon as Nia in Xenoblade 2, who also served as a healer. It may be tweaked in some way though, as Senna wields a hammer similar to the design of shield hammers from 2, though there's no sign of her defending. She seems to be a pure powerhouse attacker, leaving Tyon as the defender with his new origami weapon. It can also be used for more than defending, as shown during the cinematic fight between the two trios. He also uses them to surround himself and Yuni to create a shield. If we had to guess, he channels Aether through the origami with help of the symbols that can be spotted on the individual pieces of paper. So between the six characters, players seem to have access to two very different attackers, two different healers, and two different defenders. Now there are three more characters to discuss when it comes to this reveal trailer, but everything about them can be considered a spoiler, so let's go ahead and save them for later and instead focus on the actual world of Xenoblade 3. The first real landscape that we see reminds us of Gaur Plains from Xenoblade 1, especially with the outcropping towards the back. However, this entire place might be part of a floating island based on the way the waterfall disperses toward the bottom and how the rocks look as if they were pulled away from the ground and couldn't properly support themselves. And floating islands are still a thing, as confirmed by the Bayana shoulder in Future Connected taking place in the same world. It's certainly a new location for this trailer as well, as none of the scenes before seem to take place here. Even the flutes at sunset with Noah and Mio is located on a flat piece of rock surrounded by large trees. The next area has a wide open view displaying just how much there is to explore below. This is Xenoblade, so the vistas are going to be massive, but this one is hiding a few clues to just what it is. We can see the fallen arm from Xenoblade 1, specifically the grate that Noah is running on is distant fingertip. But to emphasize just how much has been merged between the two worlds, the mountains in the distance are the same ones that feature the Orion Titan. Its mouth can clearly be seen as well as the cleave portion after its head. It's fascinating seeing how the two worlds have come together, but there's another element that we're not sure takes after the first or second game. A blue orb can be seen just to the right on the distant fingertip that looks exactly like collectibles from Xenoblade 1. This could indicate that Xenoblade 3 is returning to that system along with, presumably, the Collectopedia. However, at no point is a UI shown during the trailer. It's also possible that these are collection points from Xenoblade 2 and are simply not indicated as such with the UI turned off. We're not sure which it will end up being at this point, as both have their advantages. Of course we have to see the other element that graces the final scene, the Makana's sword. What we're not sure of is if this is still part of the same area we just saw as the sword and the Orion Titan do appear close together in the final scene. But considering the sheer size of both, that doesn't necessarily mean much. The sword contained all of Sword Valley in Xenoblade 1, so the perspective can be kind of skewed. But again, it seems every area is merging in some way, as the rock formation to the left is straight out of Gormot. It's the backside of the Gormati Titan during the first shot shown of it in Xenoblade 2. The canyon area in the next scene is reminiscent of More Ardain from Xenoblade 2, but with all the climate changes, it's hard to be certain. There seem to be such gradual transitions that the giant Mechon tank could still be in this same canyon, or it could be closer to the Orion Titan based on the snow-covered mountains behind it. Heck, there's even a floating rock. It all lends credence to an idea we'll elaborate on after this tour through Ionios. But one thing is for certain, the Mechon tank does not have a mind of its own. Its parts are being used as part of the war effort. We're next shown a city-like area, though not a single other person can be seen. That could be a conscious removal by the developers for the trailer, though. We believe this might be a Kevis location based on its dark architecture, and the architecture itself seems to be Mechon in nature, perhaps even similar to the Mechonis capital of Agniratha. But if that's the case, why the heavy emphasis on Mechon for the Xenoblade 1 faction? Was the power of what became Agnes too much for them? 
Things to ponder another day, unfortunately, as the trailer doesn't linger long, instead shifting focus to another view of the Gower Plains-like area. This one is in the water with Blue Flamy in the background, close to the giant white mech, indicating that this is basically the Agnes counterpart to the Kevis giant mech on tank. There's also another blue collectible light in the water, and others appear throughout the rest of the trailer. A similar scene is then shown featuring Tyon standing before another massive Agnes robot, or maybe it's a military base as there are smaller structures around it. Now, here is the intriguing thing about these white robots. Both this one and the one in the water when it's activated later in the trailer feature a circle that's half filled with green light. Tyon's green light is on the left, while Noah and Mio's is on the right. Could these be some kind of countdown or fuel meter? What are they indicating as neither actively moves during their scenes? Continuing on, the floating islands are much more prominently shown and even look to be connected by giant wires that Mio actually grinds across. I thought at first that this was the first time rail grinding was a thing in Xenoblade, but Chugga informed me that it did exist in Xenoblade 2. There's only like two spots that it can be done and it's useless both times, but it is possible. Nice to see them seemingly expand on the idea. But this area could be the remnants of the Aerith Sea due to both the flying islands and what could be a teleporter on the island just behind Mio. It's definitely associated with some place in Xenoblade 1 though, as a massive Kevis vehicle or base is just to her left. The next scene places the party in a forest location with giant mushrooms. It's likely this place is the remnants of the Machna Forest from Xenoblade 1, as that did contain the thickest forest. A quad wing can even be seen behind Noah's head, a common enemy of that area. But this scene also seemingly confirms that the party size in Xenoblade 3 will be 4 instead of 3, just like in Xenoblade X, as Lands, Mio, and Senna are all following behind. With the lack of blades from Xenoblade 2, we suppose it makes sense to have four party members in battle once again, since there aren't six people on screen at any one time. Intriguingly, a four-person party isn't shown all the time. It's only Mio, Tyon, and Yuni that are running across a beach area, while what has to be a unique monster looms in the background. Near it are Taois, and just to the right are wings of another enemy, though we don't know what, as there's just not enough to go on. The rock formation just about the unique monster looks to be a symbol of some kind, but we can't exactly place it at the moment. That said, this area does seem to be a combination of the disc that holds Aerith Sea in place from Xenoblade 1 and Dana Desert, an area from Torna the Golden Country. And considering what happens to Torna, that's fascinating that its locations are reappearing here. The story likely dictates the size of the party at times, as we've seen just Noah and Mio, the trio from the previous scene, and the party of four both in the forest and now here in the ocean. This further confirms to us that this will be the case, and if the party members do follow the attacker, defender, and healer roles, then how they're utilized could range wildly from player to player. Which do you double up on? Or do you double up on two to have two defenders and two healers, or any other combo? Healing mechanics constantly change between Xenoblade games, so how will that affect the player's party makeup? We'll just have to wait as combat is never shown in the trailer. But they're certainly swimming as this is a massive body of water for the party to traverse. And there might even be new races or monsters as a fishman is riding a sea monster alongside them. Mio also has a special dive, though it may just be a special animation for the jump button to make swimming more entertaining. Hard to say for sure. But for the first time in the numbered series, and no, the scales from X don't count, there appears to be a controllable vehicle, as a boat is used to cross the ocean. It's somewhat similar to Junks from Xenoblade 1, though less curved and obviously unable to fly, almost as if the central portion of the Junks was used to create the boat. In the distance are massive rocks that bring to mind the Aerith Sea Disc once again, but a new wrinkle is the structure above the landmass, which seems to be the remains of a Lefthirian Titan. The fact that there's this much to see that a vehicle is required could hint that Ionios is one massive interconnected world like the original or Xenoblade X, rather than separated locations like in 2. There might be some required fast travel though, as there were floating islands. Unless the game eventually provides the party with a plane, it doesn't seem possible to be fully open. Either way, could combat on a boat be possible? After all, there is another sea monster in the distance. Can players choose to fight water enemies on their own turf? Before continuing on, we want to take the opportunity to point out that all six characters are shown in military uniform during their fight with one another before changing into more casual clothes when in a party. 
the casual clothes are even what's shown in their official artwork. And Noah technically has a third outfit, where he's removed his military jacket to reveal a t-shirt and has yet to put on his red jacket when teaching Mio about the flute at sunset. So that naturally leads to the question, will players be able to customize their fashion? Will each new piece of equipment change their look like in the original? Or are these clothes only changed when it's part of the story like in Xenoblade 2? That did serve a purpose in the game as it hid aspects of certain characters, but that doesn't seem to be a problem this time around, at least from what we know. At the very least, if there are set costumes that can be changed into, please don't tie them to an accessory slot. Be like Xenoblade X and allow the player to change as they see fit without affecting their stats. Continuing on in the trailer, the giant mechon tank does eventually activate and shoot a massive beam of energy. Is this a boss fight or more of a set piece that forces the party to find some way onto the tank in order to disable it? We'd guess the latter considering the size, but the later scene where Tyon is putting up a shield with his origami does seem to be in the same canyon area. Could Tyon be powerful enough to withstand a blast like that? All six do seem to be enhanced soldiers in some way based on the dialogue we've already covered, so maybe? Either way, the structure to the left of the tank is similar to Morardain, which could place this scene in the same area as before. It does seem unlikely that there'd be multiple canyon-like locations. We're next shown our only look at Nopon in the trailer, and these two are more notable than most. The blue Nopon has some kind of gun-like weapon on his back while wearing a fuzzy headpiece. The orange Nopon also has a hat, but her weapon looks more like a shield. These two also seem to be an example of star-crossed lovers, as the blue Nopon wears a Kevis outfit while the orange one is dressed in all white. This actually makes sense in this world, as Nopon were a common race in both games. Naturally, they'd be split on sides to take. Despite this, the two might even be married as the orange Nopon is wearing a ring on her wing. But here's the thing. Many have noted how their designs really resemble Rex and Pyra, and we can kinda see it. What does that mean? We have no clue unless reincarnation is suddenly a thing. This is more likely a simple Easter egg if related to the two at all and not plot important. But the aspect of this that really throws us off are the eyes. They're more human-like than we've ever seen from a Nopon. Are they all like this, or does that make this pair even more special? Unfortunately, until we see another Nopon, we're left with more questions than answers. There are only a couple scenes left to note before we dive into spoilers. The first is a sweeping shot of Yuni next to Mio and Noah, along with a fourth person that could be Lance. It's not important on its own, but they do seem to be standing on the large Kevis ship that could be seen next to the floating islands. Unsurprisingly, the group will board it eventually. They also face off against another huge tank. In this case, it's Noah and Mio against the Agnes tank that was in the water of the Gower Plains-like area. Seeing the two of them join forces, and only the two of them, does seem significant. While it feels more natural to see the two together since they are the protagonists, it also brings to mind Tyon and Yuni working together against, presumably, their own giant tank. Could there be something that separates them all into pairs and the story focuses on how they forge a bond before all coming together? It would give time for every character to be in the spotlight, and every character can be the primary one as evidenced by each one running alone at various points during the trailer. The last thing to note of this scene is that there does seem to be some kind of curved structure in the mountains behind them. It could be the outskirts of a city, but there's just not enough to say for sure. Now, rarely in trailers do I ever focus on dialogue. It's usually obvious what's being discussed, or simple fluff. But Xenoblade 3 is loaded with potential clues. We've already spoken about the ones concerning time, but there are others that focus on shifting loyalties and character concerns. Plus, the voice work already sounds better than what Xenoblade 2 offered, especially toward the beginning. The Torna DLC was a step in the right direction, and this feels like it's building off of that. One piece of dialogue has Noah asking why someone would side with them. Tell me, what would possess you to side with them? At first, we thought this was directed at Mio or one of the Agnes soldiers. But now we wonder if it's towards someone else entirely that we just haven't met. The gruff sounding voice, who we'll get to more in the spoiler section, is later speaking about how the area with the Mechonis' sword is now called Sword March. Sword March. The land pierced by a great sword. It feels like he's giving the party the next destination. That's not really much on its own, save for getting the name of an actual location, but he also says that it's the only way you're going to defeat the real enemy. It's the only way you're gonna defeat the real enemy. 
Now that is a tantalizing nugget of information. It could easily be presumed that neither Kevis nor Agnes are the true villains of the story, especially with characters from each side. But that there's a manipulator out there, or at least a group working in their own interests, while taking advantage of the ongoing war. It might even be the Ouroboros that the Kevis leader mentioned. This brings us back to Noah. Maybe when asking why someone would side with them, he's not referring to Mio and Agnes, but some other character that he trusted, and Ouroboros. Shifting loyalty seems to be something that will be very common within the story, as each character struggles to find their place in this world. Mio's line of dialogue furthers our theory that Agnes are the ones winning this war, though only barely. Because there are enemies to kill! But who is she saying it to? Could it be Tyon or Senna? Someone from the Kevis trio? Or someone we've not met at all? These vague statements continue with Land saying that he refuses to believe that someone is him. I refuse to believe you're him! This comes across as a kind of betrayal. Maybe someone he trusted was actually with Ouroboros, likely while hiding their identity with a mask? That does seem common based on the leaders of the nations. That said, it's just as likely the mention of Ouroboros was more of a metaphor and not an actual faction, so all this is pure supposition. Senna then says that she saw something coming. I knew it. I saw this coming. But that is so frustratingly vague that it could be anything. So let's just move on like Noah suggests. He's giving someone a speech saying they could try to move forward. You could try, try to move forward again. This, I do believe, is related to Mio. With her so ready to kill enemies, it's easy to see her become disillusioned with whatever reveal causes the two trios to become allies. Noah comes across as valuing all life, so it makes sense that he'd be the one encouraging her not to give up hope. Yuni's angry line of dialogue is demanding how their lives can mean so little to some person. How can our lives mean so snuffing little to you? Is this related to the time dynamic that we mentioned earlier, or how soldiers' lives are generally thrown away, justifying her decision to join the party? Then there's Mio's second line of dialogue where she seems to have softened, saying that whatever life is lost, she won't let someone shoulder it alone. Whatever life is lost, I won't let you shoulder it all alone. This distinctly seems like a response to Noah as the two form a closer bond. And with that, we've spoken about everything in the trailer that doesn't involve spoilers for Xenoblade 1 or 2. There's not much left, but if you plan to experience one or both of these games before Xenoblade 3's release, definitely do so. For everyone who has or doesn't mind spoilers, let's get right to it. So, if it hasn't been evident yet, the nation of Kevis represents Xenoblade 1, while Agnes represents Xenoblade 2, and that's reflected in their races. For Kevis, Noah is a Homs or standard human, Yuni is a High Entia as mentioned before, which just leaves Lance, who was a bit harder to place at first. The key clue is in his face and its two-tone color. He's a Machina. He's obviously more organic looking than what we've seen before, but his two-tone face matches several Machina in Xenoblade 1, like Edgel and Vinaya. That's pretty exciting to have this race represented way more than the original game ever did. It also really raises the question once again of how these three are childhood friends when High Entians and Machina have such lengthy lifespans. As for the Agnes characters, Senna is a blade as evidenced by the core crystal on her chest, while Tyon is a human, though exactly which titan his ancestors hailed from is difficult to place, likely either more ordained or Leftheria. That leaves Mio, who is actually of two worlds much like Nia before her. She has cat ears like a Gormati, but there's also a core crystal on her chest that's stained red, marking her as a flesh eater. At some point she was just a blade, but then she was fused with human cells, indicating that the flesh eater process is still in use. What significance will this have, especially with Mio sharing so many qualities with Nia? There's certain to be something as another woman's voice, who's not Mio, Senna, or Yuni, says, Fine for you, isn't it? All that time you've got. Which seems to be a direct reference to Mio as a flesh eater, unless it's instead focused on the time that's fueled by the unknown clock. Then there's the character, with the large build, the pompadour, the eye patch, and scar across his face. He's an important figure, but his existence should be impossible. This is Van Damme, and rather than a new character sharing the name like in past Xenoblades, this seems to be the same one from Xenoblade 2. 
Not only is the design similar, but it's the same voice actor. That's no coincidence. But how is Van Damme here when he died in Xenoblade 2? Is reincarnation an aspect of the story after all? Or could this be what an offseer is? People capable of seeing images of the past. But if that's the case, why is Van Damme in a different outfit with a new beard and scar? Moreover, his new clothes seem to place him as part of the Kevis Nation, which we just said represents Xenoblade 1, which he had no part in. This grants him aspects of both sides and could show him as a truly neutral party. This could be why he's the one to get the two trios to work together towards some shared goal. He says during the trailer that they're not enemies now. It's why we believe that he somehow stops their fight and shows them the evils of the Ouroboros, or whoever the true villain may be. There are only two more characters shown during the trailer. The first is wearing some kind of mask with its eyes closed and the crisscrosses of a veil placed on top of it. But despite the mask, it's obvious that this woman is Melia from Xenoblade 1. She has Melia's exact wings as a high Entia along with her trademark curled hair. It also makes sense that she's in a position of power as she both has a long life and was made Empress of the High Entias at the end of Future Connected. But what was it that made her go into conflict with Agnes? Could the lack of Shulk's influence really have changed her so much? And immediately after her, a similar woman in a mask is shown, representing Agnes. This mask is Gormati in nature with the eyes open, a yellow face, Gormati ears, and only a few lines along the cheeks. What these designs mean, if anything, is unknown. Similar to how we have no idea how Nia rose to such a position of power. And this is Nia based on her clothes, the fact that she's Gormati, and her Flesh Eater Core Crystal. Nia is a powerful blade, but is that enough to become leader of an entire nation? Especially one that seems to have taken its design aesthetic from her blade form. And is she talking about Kevis when she says they must be erased without a trace? Just what happened between her and Melia? Is this just a thing when the main character rejects your love for another? Poor Nia. Poor Melia! The final thing we want to focus on is Noah's sword. You've been waiting for it. Its design seems like a more advanced version of the replica Monado EX from Future Connected, though the blade manifests around the entire sword rather than extending mainly from the tip. The core of the sword is different, with the new symbol in the center but we have seen it before as it's the same one as the giant robots employed by Agnes. It's another symbol of time, so will it have to be fueled too? Or can it manipulate the ether around it as well? The symbol changes in the trailer too, only once though as the blue light that fills the right seems to fill the entire circle as he goes back to back with Mio standing against the giant Agnes robot. Does each position unlock a new power? Is it a fuel gauge of some sort? Or is there some kind of other power that this sword possesses? But with that, we finally covered everything of note in the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 announcement trailer that we could find. It's obvious we've only scratched the surface, but what has been shown is downright enticing for longtime fans. There's only seven months until its release in September, so it's sure to get highlighted again. Hopefully there, we'll learn more about this new world, see more characters, and learn about the changes to its battle system. There's a polish to Xenoblade 3 that's incredibly exciting, and we believe Takahashi when he says the team is taking everything they learned from the previous games to craft this one. I want to thank Chugga Conroy for joining me today, as many of the finer details of this deep dive wouldn't have been possible without him. You can find a link to his channel and his wonderful Let's Plays of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2 in the description below. Even if you've played the games before, I guarantee you'll learn something from his playthroughs. But how are you feeling about Xenoblade Chronicles 3 so far? What are your theories? Let us know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this deep dive, please consider subscribing to Good Vibes Gaming, hitting the like button, and ringing that bell. We also have a Patreon at patreon.com slash gvgaming with plenty of extra perks. Until next time, bye!